Everybody get a good night's sleep? Everybody but me. I'm still in California time, so. Okay, so thank you all for coming to this. Uh, my name is Richard Metzger, and I am, uh, along with my business partner, Gary Baddeley, who's sitting over there in the gray shirt, one of the co-founders of the disinformation company, Limited, and it's very exciting to be here, communing with all you groovy people here in nature at the Omega Institute. And um, <laughs> if, uh, if Howard's talk last night was anything to go by, I think we're in for a provocative and mind-expanding weekend, so... I'm glad you're all here. So also before I get started, I want to thank the staff at Omega for inviting us to do this weekend and providing this lovely environment, which is relaxing and cut off from everything else and uh, its, its, own, its own world. And um, so in a way, this, this event is kind of like a continuation of the DisinfoCon event from four years ago, which I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen, maybe on the DVD, if maybe some of you were there. And, um, but this event will be a little bit different because we won't be talking at you the whole time, although I'm going to do a little bit of that for a while. And um, it'll be more interactive. And um, I've never actually done a workshop like this before. I've attended many of them. And um, in fact, I saw a, a really interesting Terrence McKenna lecture in the, in the 90s. That was a whole weekend that he did. And that was interesting because I got to observe him. And I read his books for so many years, and I've been so interested in his work. I got to you know, meet him and watch him interact with other people, watch him be cranky. And uh, it, was, it was interesting to see, you know, somebody firsthand. You know, you read their books, and then you... It's quite a different thing to meet them. And uh, Genesis Peorage had told me uh, a story a few years ago about how he met Brian Geisen in Paris and when he was younger, and that he had never met anybody who was more mentally alive than Brian Geisen, and who was very sick at that point and had been for some time. And the point of his story it was that he had a personal contact with Geisen, which uh, Geisen called touching hands. You had to touch hands. That was, that was the way this, this transmission had to take place. And, you know, it was, that was the key to understanding what he had been reading, for Genesis had been reading all these years about Brian Geisen, was to meet him. But he also saw a frail human side, and um, that, too, was very educational for him. So w- it was funny, because when I was 17, I uh, basically, I got kicked out of high school. I sort of ran away from home and went to London to live for a couple years, and one of the reasons that I went was to meet Genesis and to check out his scene, because I, um, I figured that he knew something that I didn't know, and I wanted to know what he knew, so I went and bugged him about it, and um, it's, it's gratifying now that, that I can count him as a, as a good friend of mine, so, um, and you can also imagine how nice it is to be here with Doug, with Grant, with Paul, with Howard, and for all of us to be able to get together, because we don't see each other all that often, because we all live in uh, different cities, and in case of Grant, lives in, in Scotland, so he's in another continent, so it's great. And um, so first and foremost, I want to, I hope that you are all going to get your money's worth, because I know this is an expensive proposition for many of you, and so by touching hands, as Brian Geisen put it, so um, that's one way. And so we're here this weekend to be at your disposal. So if you have any questions, you know, introduce yourselves and feel free to ask questions and help us to help you, in other words, and um, to get your money's worth. So, um, but before I leave this notion of, of meeting people whose writing or their life or whatever serves as some kind of example or as an inspiration for people, um, I've been lucky to meet a lot of my heroes, Timothy Leary, Robert Anton Wilson, Kenneth Anger, Andy Warhol, William Burroughs, Terrence McKenna, and I've also had the good fortune to meet and work with some artists whose work I admire, like Marilyn Manson, Jello Biafra, Yasuhura Kanishi from the Pizzicato Five, um, pop group from Japan. And it's fascinating to see how these people work and what influences they bring to their work as artists. And it's also fun to see what kind of shit they have around their house and what they have in the fridge. And in Marilyn Manson's case, what he has in his medicine cabinet. <laughs> so... Like I say, it's a, it's a learning experience, but it can also be a learning experience because it's disappointing. And um, there's I also think that finding out that some of your heroes have feet of clay has a value too. And it's it's funny, and it's human, you know. And um, I was very excited once to, when the first person to call me at my brand new apartment at that time in L.A. was Timothy Leary, and I was like, wow, you know, Timothy Leary is calling me. It was. The, the, it was, a, it, was a, it was the very first person to leave a message, I think. I'm listening to the message, and he wanted to borrow six grand. 
That's true. That's true. So, so also, so I just want to reiterate, you know, feel free to ask people questions and, and introduce yourselves. And I know that some of the people here have fairly um, spooky public images. So it's all showbiz. I know them all. They're all pussycats, except for me. So um, let's get started. I want to first give you like a sort of a potted history of um, disinformation and how it came to be and why and what it is and what we do. Media company that's based in New York City and based in Los Angeles, also where I live. And our activities encompass book publishing, live events like this one, or the DisinfoCon, our website. We publish DVDs. We did a television program for a couple of years, and we hope we do another one. And since all of our various activities fall under the rubric of disinformation, I figured I should explain exactly what that means or what that means to us. So disinformation means a mixture of truth and lies. And a mixture of truth and lies used as a, an information smokescreen to confuse and to disorient the public. So it's a very insidious form of propaganda. And it's a term that's usually associated with the CIA. And the example that I always use when I try to explain this is there's probably about 400 books in the Kennedy assassination, and maybe, maybe a quarter of those books are kind of nutty, you know, books. And they were probably funded or published by the CIA in some way, in some kind of front group. And the idea that it was to discredit anybody who would be looking into that sort of thing, you know, JFK assassination. It's like, you know, so it's it, anyone else, a more sober researcher looking into that would be considered a nut job by association. So I think everybody can understand how that works. So the issue is it gets, becomes confused by white noise and then the public just gets to eat static. And um, that is also how investigative journalism uh, came to be known as conspiracy theory. You know, and I just want to, for the record, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I just play one on TV. So, so when we use the term disinformation, we're trying to reclaim it in an ironic way. And we're telling you in the door that don't necessarily believe what you read in the paper or what you see on TV or your advertising or the mainstream media, but don't believe us either. So wh why would you want to believe me? It does, it, 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 if you see what I'm saying, it doesn't make sense. We're trying to like encourage people to be incredulous no matter where the information that they get comes from and to look at it with, with a, you know, a, a jaundiced eye, I guess. And um, so, the idea, you know, again, the idea is to just encourage skepticism so every time you pick up a newspaper, watch television, see an advertisement, surf the internet, that you would understand that the, mix, the media is a mixture of truth and of lies. And that's often inaccurate, biased, incomplete, and very often serving the interests of the people who own those media outlets, such as Rupert Murdoch, for instance. Um, we recently published the, uh, it was an ant, we recently published um, the outfoxed documentary, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, and that proves very dramatically how these media um, outlets, these fair and biased so-called media outlets can be definitely skewed to, to a, an ideology and to a, a political party like the Republicans. So um, whoever controls what you see then controls what you think. And I think that that makes sense. You know, there's a saying on Madison Avenue, if you don't know about it, you can't buy it. And, um, you know, and Madison Avenue knows how to control your input, and they know how to, uh, you know, you are what you eat, right? So another good example of how that works is that um, General Electric owns NBC. So are you going to get an unbiased account of nuclear power when you watch NBC News, you know, uh, probably not, but you probably will see stories about the new generation of safe nuclear power plants that they have in France. Well, guess who built them? Ha, ah, General Electric. You know, what a shock. So, you know, you, when you get your intellectual input skewed that way, if you haven't heard anything to the contrary, well, nuclear power plants are safe. I heard it on the news. You know, that's, it's just, this is, it's, it's natural to be that way. And, um, you know, you might come to think that toxic sludge is good for you, if that's all you've heard as well. So it's quite a striking commentary, I think, on freedom of the press when the world's largest defense contractor owns the world's largest television network. You know, so this is something just to keep in mind when you're watching TV. So these are the kinds of things that I was thinking about myself in the early 90s when I was, um, I was a volunteer for the presidential campaign for Jerry Brown. And um, for those of you who are too young to know, he was a two-term governor of California in the 70s, and um, he was running against Bill Clinton. And he was saying really outrageous sort of, you know, 
most outrageous class war kind of rhetoric I'd ever, I'd ever heard a major politician make. I mean, like, it was, it was unbelievable, and he's a really good speaker, and people got really fired up about Jerry Brown, and it was really exhilarating to hear somebody speak that way in public and get on to C-SPAN and, and CNN and, and say these things, and I didn't think he had a snowball's chance of hell of getting elected president, nor did I think he would necessarily be that great of a president, but it was amazing to hear this, and, and I wanted to support that. So... Um, but for a moment there, he actually had placed quite well in some of the primaries, and, and he actually kicked Bill Clinton's ass several times. So the media had to start taking him seriously. And what I saw happen in New York City, there were about six people working in an office that was probably that big. And then it grew to there was like about 100 people, and then 200 people, and then a couple of thousand people probably uh, within the, the two weeks leading up to the New York primary. And, but it was like a real, like, like it was like a movement it was like this grassroots thing that just, it formed so quickly, and it formed by itself because there was nobody who was in charge. It was just like, okay, you, do what you want to do. It was, I mean, literally people would like come in with a position paper that they would have edited together from some interview that they read of him, and it would be all printed out, and they just put a stack of them down. I mean, that's how grassroots it was. I mean, there wasn't anybody saying like, oh, you can't do this, or it has to come through the official campaign. People were just doing what they wanted to do, and, and it was in, in good faith, and that's how that happened. And... Um, so the, but the people who were working there felt very strongly about his message, and I think it's probably analogous to what, how people got jazzed up for Howard Dean in this current election cycle. Like, again, I want to just say it was like this movement. And uh, the Brown for uh, President headquarters was at, on 42nd Street back when it was still owned by the hookers and the um, crack dealers and not the Walt Disney Corporation. So, you know, but every, you know, every day I would see hundreds of people filing in there. There were like sort of Grateful Dead types, and there were um, uh, union people, a lot of people who were with the hospital union were supporting Brown. Bryce Martin, the famous painter, was one of the people who would come in and call people and, you know, get to get the vote out and so forth. And um, like I say, it was just this outrageous thing that sort of organized itself. And this stood in stark contrast to the Clinton campaign headquarters where, if you went by there, there were two people in a very nice gleaming office, two yuppies handing, giving you a Clinton bumper sticker. And that's what it was. I mean, it's, I mean, there was a movement there were two people who were being paid on staff, and that's what I saw with my own two eyes. And so I'd go to campaign rallies, and there would be like 5,000 people there getting quite worked up by Jerry Brown's speech. And but then I would, I, and I was like a you know news junkie, so I'd, I would buy like four newspapers a day in New York, and you know I would see Broadway and 72nd Street closed down because there were so many people who wanted to speak to him that they, the, the cars couldn't get by. And then I would read about a small and unenthusiastic audience who was there to see Jerry Brown, and, um, or that he would be described as a fringe candidate. And this is a fringe candidate whose father was a governor of California, who himself was a two-time governor of California. And you know, the, the uh, Brown family was like the West Coast Kennedys. His sister was a secretary of state in California at that time. So, you know, this, again, a fringe candidate who would kick Bill Clinton's ass in several of the, the primaries. But this is the way it was being reported on. And it was just very interesting to see how all of the various newspapers in New York, the Daily News, the New York Times, the Post, the Daily News, would report the same event, but from vastly different perspectives. The same event that I would see as an eyewitness to the event would be reported in a way that, very contradictory way that, you know, they say, you know, tr truth, you know, uh, uh, there's two sides to every story and truth is somewhere in the middle. And here, none of these truths, as it were, reconciled themselves with what I saw. So that was very eye-opening for me, and I thought about this for a long time, and I was on unemployment insurance at the time, so I moved to California, and I watched the election all the time. I hardly left the apartment for like six months because I would just flip channels and watch how it was being talked about on CNN and how it was being talked about on the, all the networks, and it was, it was, like I say, it was really fascinating. And I, at that time, also... I was taking meetings because I was um, trying to get some TV show ideas off the ground. And one of those things was this idea that I had for like a new generation of 60 Minutes that was called disinformation. And I would go around and I would pitch this. It was like the idea to you know, present viewpoints that hadn't been, you know, that weren't seen, more liberal, more progressive viewpoints than you would normally see on a 60 Minutes type show. And I would always hear the same thing. Wow, I would really love to see something like that. It'll never get on the air. And I hear that every meeting. And um, no one will advertise. Right, and then um, one guy said, "Oh, I'd love to see something like that. Never get there unless you get somebody like Oliver Stone to put his name on it." And I thought that was a great idea, and I went home and I faxed Oliver Stone the idea that day. 
and his assistant faxed it to him. He was in Thailand working on a film called Heaven and Earth, and he loved the idea. So the next thing I knew, um, I was having this thing sort of godfathered, as, as it were, with, through the Hollywood maze with Oliver Stone as executive producer, and it didn't, um, it didn't fly then. It was, I think it was too early to do something like this. But a few years later, Oliver and his business partner, Janet Yang, recommended me for this gig to do a series of CD-ROMs um, at a company that was owned by uh, TCI, which, is the, which was at the time the world's largest cable corporation, and now that's known as AT&T Broadband. Many of you have probably heard of it. And um, that project never happened, but I, I got my foot in the corporate door in that way, and I was able to maneuver it so this old TV idea, this disinformation idea, was reborn as an Internet thing. Now, and this is 1995, 94, 95, so this is the time when the executives at TCI did not have email. They were not on the internet. They did not know what it was. When I took the job, I had never been on the internet. I had been on AOL like two times. So th- nobody really knew what it was. They'd heard about it. it was, it's, it's hard to imagine that now, but like 10 years ago, the internet was a vague concept to a lot of people. The information superhighway, but you heard about it, you weren't on it necessarily. And um, so the, all of these media corporations said, well, we, have to, we have to get in on this thing. If we don't get in on it now, it's, we're going to be dinosaurs. Remember how that whole thing is going to, New York Times is going to go away because of the internet. All these things that didn't happen, of course, but that's what the, the, the line of thinking was. So I was able to get in there and sort of fly under the radar, as it were, and get corporate funding for something that they thought, $1.2 million to be exact, between advertising and staffing. Mean, there was no thing, we had to build a search engine from scratch then. It wasn't like you'd go and buy one off the shelf for 40 bucks like you could now. You had to buy these, you know, you had to make these things from scratch. They'd be like a, a programmer getting paid $100,000. I know 1.2 seems a lot to do to a website, but back then you had to really put a lot of effort into these kind of things. And it was advertised to the tune of $300,000. When you got onto the Netscape page originally, there was a choice of like InfoSeek, Lycos, Yahoo, Hotbot, and disinformation because they had paid for this at TCI, and um, so they thought it was some kind of like X-Files type thing. That's all they thought it was, and, and, and they would come in, and there would be like a meeting, and I would come in in a suit, and, and I would show them like, oh, and then you click on this, and then you click on this, and it's like aliens and, and you know, extraterrestrial life forms. And I would just give them the thing. And I kept saying, like, it was like, and it'll just be like, it'll, this will be a thing, and it'll capture the, the mind share of the audience, and it'll be like MTV. And I kept saying that over and over again, like MTV, like MTV, like MTV. And, and, they, and they were just like, okay. And these guys, I mean, again, these guys had never been on the internet, so it looks slick to them. They say, oh, aliens. Oh, and the guy, and the, I remember the guy said, well, this isn't my sort of thing, but I can see why people would like it. And just, just, and just patted me on the head, and he walked on down the hall to the next meeting. And, I just, and it just went like that, and nobody really said, like, I want to see this in depth. And, you know, it was like, you could find things about how to cook up crystal meth on the website. But I wasn't going to show that to him. Now I was. I'm not stupid. So, so, the, um, so the thing launches on, on Friday the 13th, uh, uh, September 1996. And um, because of this placement on the Netscape page, it launched to about 16,000 people a day hitting the site. And that is a lot. And that would be very difficult to do today because there's too many websites. There's a million. Who cares? But back then, again, it's hard to remember this, there were hardly any professional websites at the time. There were a few dozen at best. So if you have, you know, you light a candle in the darkness, all the moths will come to your flame. So we had 16,000 people a day, you know, MSNBC, uh, MSN.com, so it was site of the day, and, you know, again, the traffic was just through the roof right away. And um, what happened was it was featured on CNN, the LA Times, a lot, a lot of different places, but when an article appeared in Variety called TCI's disinformation gives the left an online voice. Uh, this attracted the attention of the CEO of um, TCI, and it's a man named John Malone, who is a notoriously right-wing guy. There's a, there's a famous audio tape of him ranting about the East Coast liberal media establishment and how they're out to get him. This, that a, lot of, a lot of reporters have heard. It's pretty hilarious. But this guy is generally considered to be to the right of Rush Limbaugh, or Attila the Hun. And um, so dis- dis- TCI's disinformation gives the left an online voice. So this pissed him off. 
as you might imagine. And so the story that I heard from two guys who were in the room at the time was that there were a bunch of guys in suits, and they were just standing there. And he, was in a, and he wheeled his chair across the floor, put on his glasses, and he dialed it up on his, on his Internet browser, and, said, and it was corporate control of the mass media was the topic of the day. And he's like, what is this anarchist bullshit? Do we pay for this? And these guys are like, get rid of it. So I, um, I got the call. I got the fateful call. And um, so uh, I had worked in this for a long time, and I, put a, I was not about to see it flush down the toilet without a fight or without an argument. And I very politely suggested to the executive making the call that he, they should just give it to me because it wasn't something that they could sell off. You can't hold a website in your hands. It's a ser- series of zeros and ones. You cannot wrap cellophane around it. You cannot ship it. And I had written 99% of the content. So why not just give it to me and take a, a million to write off for tax purposes, which a company like that can use, and just it'll be cool and I'll go away quietly. And if you don't, I won't go away quietly. And I will call the Washington Post and I will tell them how um, I spent a million to of your stockholders' money on my anarchist bullshit at a time when their stock had dropped from $29 a share to $13 a share in under 10 months. So that was a very serious threat to make to a $50 billion market cap company. And this guy understood that his career would be over. He would be the fall guy for my anarchist bullshit. I would be the Abby Hoffman of the internet, and at the very least get a book deal out of it. And um, they took the hint. You know, I mean, can you just imagine the, the mad scramble of like the news getting, oh, John Millennial, we spent a million point two of your money. You didn't even know what we were spending it on. So that was, that was the, the threat was quite, was quite a, a serious one for these guys. So um, I was promptly awarded full ownership of disinformation and, and four months severance pay. And um, so to make a long story short, the, that's, that's how it started. I moved back to New York right away. I think I moved back to New York the next day, pretty much. And, um, um, and I soon after that hooked up with a company called Razorfish, who was once a very high-flying internet design firm. And then Gary and I hooked up about 10 months after that and uh, endeavored to turn disinformation into a real business. And by the way, I am not the person who runs the company. The brains behind the company is sitting over there, and he runs it, and I'm just like the lead singer. So the mascot. I'm the Mickey Mouse. And we were also able to get another million two out of Razorfish. So the dot-com boom was very, very good to us. And, um, you know, all these other dot-com companies have gone bust, and we're still around. So we've we've either done something right, or we were very fucking lucky. So um, that's the potted history of the company. And like I said, we publish DVDs, we do live events, and um, OutFox is one of our recent things, Uncovered, the, the whole truth about the war in Iraq was a DVD that we put out. So we've been able to associate ourselves with some great things. We put out Doug's graphic novel recently. And, um, you know, that's, that's it. I'm going to pause for any questions that anybody has right now about what we do at Disinformation. Anyone have anything they want to ask about that? Like the business side of things, or yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it, it's it's on a case by case basis, really. You know, you want to make sure that people can get this kind of stuff, I and mean, that's also in consultation with the people who are out there soliciting the orders for it, and also the director, and he wanted to get it out there, so. You know, it's it's also an hour long, so you want to, you know, that seemed to be the right price for it. Yeah. Well, both. There's an editor named Alex Burns who it lives in Australia, and he, a lot of it's through Alex, but also people submit stuff, and Gary posts stuff, and Ralph posts stuff. I mean, there's a lot of people who are who are contributing to that, you know, who are just surfing the way they find something weird. You know, Robert Anton Wilson has a list that he sends out to about 30 people every day who are his friends, and Alex is on that list, so some of it comes via Bob Wilson in a roundabout way. So, you know, it's, it's like that. Yeah? Connected, no. I mean, in the sense that we would link to them. I mean, Move On put out uh, Uncovered and Outfox themselves to their constituency. And we've put out a, a retail version of that. So in, in that sense, it's cooperative. But we don't work with them that, that closely, no. Yeah? It doesn't? Au contraire. 
It's the number, yeah, go look on Amazon. It's, not, it's the number two product on Amazon. It's been the number one product on Amazon for about three weeks. It's coming, well, it's, that's, not, that's not our company that's distributing it to theaters, but it, it actually, it did open uh, in limited release last weekend. It did really well. It's seventy-eight thousand dollars per theater, which is great for an independent documentary, and it's opening in more cities this weekend. So actually, it's showing. You're wrong about that. It's really, really getting out there. There's, there's probably how many copies of that would you say are out there? We've we've got put out about sixty thousand. What about Move On? Okay, so about one hundred and twenty. I mean, that's a lot. You know, for an independent documentary, it's a lot. Yeah. Well, that's that's com- that's being distributed in theaters by a company called Cinema Libra, and uh, re- when the at the Republican National Convention, that'll be premiering in New York. <laughs> so, yeah, that ought to be fun. Anybody else before I move on? Okay, so um, in the second part of this lecture, I wanted to discuss the idea of magic and uh, some incredible, incredible imagery as well. So people have an assumption that magic is about this kind of hocus-pocus, eye of newt, tongue of toad thing, or, or it's some kind of incense and affirmations school of thought that a lot of New Agers and Wiccans are into. And I don't see it that way. And um, when I was a teenager, I remember reading in those research books, which I'm sure a lot of you have read, something that Genesis Peorage had said about a modern magician, a modern-day sorcerer, would use the tools of their time. They would employ the tools of their time, video cameras, fax machines, computers, tape recorders, electronic instruments. You know, you could be in a rock band like he was and be a magician, be a sorcerer. And the idea was, and now you would use the internet, right? But the idea was that since you could use these, th- these things to work magic, and magic is so much about intent that it stands to reason that these things would amplify the signal that you were trying to work on. So advertising also could be seen in that way as a magical act because it allows these large corporations to create a desire in your head for something, for a product, and you would go out and buy something that you don't necessarily need but you decide that you want. If it's, oh, it's a new kind of soap, and I want to be this clean, or my hair is going to be silky smooth if I use this kind of thing. And, and you know, that's why you buy one brand versus another brand, and, and that is a kind of a magic, right? Um, Alistair Crowley said that the magical way, though, to open a door was to walk across the room, turn the knob, and pull. So... And I'm being serious when I say this. If you, when you go onto the internet, you can make a few simple commands, and a book will appear in the mail a few days later. Okay, now that's a magical act, and you don't have to leave your home. And that's, in a sense, it serves to illustrate how computer programming and, um, like, say, following a spell from a medieval grimoire is the sort of the same thing. Because you could, it's about putting the effort into the right place. And, of course, you could endeavor to constrain a demon to bring you that book, and it might work, but it might also be easier just to go on Amazon and, and get it in that way. So it's, um, there's, there is some kind of... which That's not to say there isn't kind of like a hoodoo element to magic, but of course there is. And when strange synchronicities, coincidences, and things like this start to give you the cosmic wink, then you know you're doing something right. But that's another discussion entirely. So, and we'll get to that in due course. But... So Crowley is the guy who coined the term, magic is actually how he pronounced it. It was the idea that it was the, the art and science of the magi. And it was that, the idea was to, to distinguish that from like stage magic, conjuring, sleight of hand, card tricks, you know. And it's also about, similar to what Arthur C. Clarke said about any sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic. And you'll see a lot of that kind of uh, line of thinking in Paul Offaly's lecture tonight. And Paul has a very good line, I think, to illustrate this, and it's worth repeating now. He says that if you look at towards science fiction, the gap between coming up with an idea, you know, the R&D phase, and actually uh, manufacturing it, it doesn't exist anymore. And he, the, the example that he uses is um, about the communicators in Star Trek and how they are cell phones that we use today. And, um, but I'll let Paul tell you more about that, and of course, time machines, when, when his lecture is up tonight. So these things, magic and science, are not mutually exclusive to me, you know. And if you look 
back in history towards alchemy, which predates science per se, it's interesting to see how, in recent decades, some of these alchemical concepts, especially in physics, which is the most psychedelic of all sciences, have incorporated these, these kinds of ideas from, from a long time ago. Um, Bell's non-locality uh, theorem, the idea that you know, there's always a connection. If you've connected at one time, you know, there's this instantaneous, faster-than-light connection that exists, is in some ways, in many ways, analogous to like, the idea of the law of contagion in magic. We have to have you know, some, a piece of sod that someone has trod on or a piece of their hair or something like that. You know, and that's, you know, these ancient people understood that you have to make that link. So if science tells us that that, that connection is there, why, you know, why would, this not, would this not be the case? And so that indicates maybe that there's some kind of spooky, like etheric fluid that we're walking around in. Now, is that New Age thinking? Is that magical thinking? Or is that something that science will eventually say, all right, you know, this is... This is, this is a reality. And you look, you look at a lot of Sheldrake's experience, uh, experiments, rather, and they do really point to the fact that this, this could be the case. And, um, and of course, as this, the saying goes, you know, it wasn't a fish that discovered water. So it, 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 it stands to reason that these kinds of things will be discovered in time by science to be real things, not some kind of, you know, New Age bullshit or, you know, some, some kind of fringy kind of stuff. And that's why, like, I think, you know, this, this whole kind of idea of, like, the magician with, you know, you know, these people go around trying to be spooky. If any of you have ever gone to any of these kind of things, it's, there's always some kind of goth person who's very, you know, trying to be... It's, 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 really, it's really embarrassing, and it's, that's not what it's all about. I mean, you know, to me, a magician is somebody like um, Picasso, Miles Davis, John Coltrane. You know, the guy had the idea that he could try to heal people with his horn, okay? So you're hearing somebody literally, like, pray, through a saxophone, through an alto saxophone. So that's the kind of thing. Someone like Bjork might be somebody who you could look at as a, as a magician. You know what I mean? Someone who uses creativity and intent to, to, to get their point across and to, to, and to you know, work on many different levels. You know, it's like Grant works in the medium of comics for his magic. You know, Doug writes books and gives public lectures. Paul paints. You know, uh, I have what we consider to be a magical business, you know, and, and, and not only are we in the, the business of selling these kinds of magical ideas, but it's, it's fun to, just to be able to do this and see how something like Fo- outfoxed has a resonance in the culture. It's, it's amusing to us. You know, and Gary may not feel the same way I do about this at all, but it doesn't really matter. You know? Or maybe he does. I'm looking at his... But, uh, but you, know, you know what I'm saying? So it's, 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 it's the way this kind of stuff works. And it's, um, in, in our case, having a, a business is a large canvas to be able to work with in that way. So... Um, so much of magical methodology is aimed at self-enhancement and you can find value in these techniques even if you don't believe in the kind of hoodoo you know, elements or you don't really see yourself as pursuing a spiritual path or anything like that you could look at it as the training of your mind the consciousness, the subconsciousness to work in favor of maximizing your desires and what you would like to see manifest in your lives. And neurolinguistic programming can be seen in that light. And um, the first NLP book in the 1970s was called The Structure of Magic. That's what it was called, and it's long out of print. But these guys knew what they were doing. They, they called it that for a reason, obviously. You know, you're going to think about your book title. And that's what NLP is. It's a magical act. And... Um, so everybody probably knows this, but it's worth repeating for those of you who don't, that the capsule description of magic that Crowley gives in Magic and Theory and Practice is that magic is the art and the science of causing change in conformity with will. And that's a pretty elastic definition that could encompass just about any form of magic that I could think of. And there's the secular magic, the NLP kind of magic, and that might be better described as persuasion. You know, so advertising and some of these things that I was going to say are, are, could be put under that, under that category. And um, those things are certainly magic. And, but this is not to say, again, that there aren't these more hocus-pocusy notions of magic, sex magic, hexes, invocations, and all of that, or creative combinations of all of the above. But because everything in our lives is full of meaning and connection and um, messages that are aimed towards our development as, as people. And 
in the Western magical traditions, the idea of taking everything as a direct communication of the universe or God, of God talking to your soul is called crossing the abyss. And that could be a dangerous position to find yourself in because, you know, once you start taking this kind of stuff seriously, you know, these things kind of start to happen to you. And I think a lot of you are nodding, so you know what, what I'm talking about. And um, the best example, I think, that, that if you haven't, any of you, if, how many of you read Cosmic Trigger by Robert Anton Wilson? Show of hands. Okay, the ones of you who haven't should probably go out and get that book because it's a really amazing book, and it certainly is a very honest book, and it was written in, uh, you know, by you know, a guy who was a father of three and a very sober, sort of skeptical, rational-minded human being. Yeah, yeah? Robert Anton Wilson. The book's called The Cosmic Trigger. And um, because when you start messing around with this stuff, it has consequences, and, and his, um, his book... It's kind of a diary of what his, his personal transformation was like. And I think, like I say, you, anybody here would benefit from reading that book, probably reading it several times. I know I have at different stages of my life, and I've always gotten a lot out of reading that book. And I know him now, it's too. It's, 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 a, it's a fascinating book. So, and so these things will have consequences for good or for ill when you start putting them into motion. And, you know, the, some of this is going to depend on your karma, or your own moral compass, you know, and if you look at like the, the Wiccan read of harm none or the threefold law of return, you know, whatever you do will come back at you mm-hmm. times three. These things make a lot of sense as a, as a guide to your, to your behavior. And, um, you know, you shouldn't behave in low down and nasty ways when you use magic because, you know, the idea of, you know, doing a curse or something because as the saying goes, you know, spit in the wind and it's going to come back in your face. So, The idea is that magic is relevant to people who seek personal autonomy and um, to be beyond the control of authorities, institutions, and social pressures. And magic, or magic, aside from that notion of, you know, smiting your enemies and all that, low magic as opposed to the art and science of the magi, is definitely a tool for personal empowerment, like I was saying. And in that respect, I would liken it to learning a martial art. All right? So when you meet somebody who's like a magical personality, you are encountering someone who has amazing powers of concentration normally and um, somebody who is, has the ability to scratch several itches with one strategic movement, right? And you think on different levels. You know, if you think it, it's, and these are the kind of things that your mind is, then becomes trained to do in the way that you would, again, train yourself in a, in a martial art, you know? And, you know, so there's this notion of practicing, that has to go into all of this. You can't just read a book and decide that, oh, I'm a magician now and I'm all powerful and mighty. You know, so these are techniques. They're techniques as, uh, that anybody could do. You know, um, Everybody's nervous system is exactly the same. It's not like somebody is born and they're Dr. Strange and they can go out and sh- you know, shoot shit out of their hands and stuff, but um, I can. <laughs> but I'm from West Virginia. And we're all like that down there. You just don't know it because we don't we don't advertise it. So, but um, so you know this. Like I say, this it trains your mind. You can see past the bullshit. You can see past advertising. You can see past all of these things, and it becomes it's no longer relevant in your life because you can also see how these things can change so quickly. You know. Also, the older you get, you start to have a, bit, a larger perspective on things and how they change so quickly too. So, it's a it, it, like I say, it's a useful exercise in training your mind, and. Um, that's one of the things that I was hoping for with the, the Book of Lies anthology that I edited, was to encourage this kind of thinking, in, especially in younger readers, because I'm hoping that you know, the generation of up-and-coming sorcerers and magicians will, will cause a mutation in the culture that I live in. That, that was my goal. That's my intention when I write, you know, edit this book and publish this book, is to, to make people see something a little bit differently and, and, you know, have some kind of ripple effect, maybe. And, um, you know, I thought that the 90s were a really sorry decade. Shitty music, shitty movies, you know, you saw cinema turned into, like, a marketing drivel. You know, it, was just, it just wasn't what it was back in the 70s. And, um, but something really important did happen, and that was that computing power became so cheap and that so many people could get their hands on it, and um, especially video equipment. You know, 15 years ago, it would cost half a million dollars to what you can get in a $2,000 G4, 
and you know, put it on your desktop. So, um, and the TV show that we made was made primarily in my living room. So, you know, and it was made primarily by two people. And we were able to then have that broadcast on British network television. So that's kind of a magical act, too, if you think about it. It's like from my living room to, you know, a nation of 45 million or however many people live there. And uh, that was um, something that was exciting. And again, by my definition, that's a magical act. So, um, But back in the, in the 90s with, like, the Mondo 2000 magazine, all this kind of there was a lot of talk about reality hacking and all this kind of stuff. And I was ultimately very disappointed by that because there were a lot of people who were early adopters who did pick up on this kind of stuff and talk about it, and, you know, people like, are you serious, and Doug, and myself being, like, cheerleaders for this kind of thing, Timothy Leary, gung-ho about all this kind of stuff, but it didn't really change a whole lot of stuff then. However, and also someone who's 15 who gets their hands on a computer is going to be using it in a different way from somebody who gets it from when the time they're taking their first steps. So we're only going to start seeing this mutation happening, like, now. Like, now. You know what I mean? When you see a six-year-old who can log on and, you know, use a paint program. You, you know, this is a serious thing. This is a talent that didn't exist. And these are tools that didn't exist. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, I, I always thought it was amazing when I would see, like, a friend of mine's kid, like, use a remote control in a VCR. Oh, look at that kid. He's so sophisticated. But, I mean, this, this is a, we're talking about an order of magnitude here. So um, that's what I think we're starting to see is this mutant race appearing and that these you know, these vanguard types, whether they see themselves as magicians or as activists, it's irrelevant. It really is irrelevant. It's, it, these are metaphors. And, um, you know, in a sense, by the way, what, I'm, what I am suggesting in this is, is be more clever with everything you do. Be more clever and be more creative, you know? So, um, and I, this may sound daft, but I do think that we are going to see a societal change that will be similar to the 60s. You know, it's... it's talking a long time, it's, it's, it, that pendulum has taken a long time to swing back, but I think it's kind of happening now with younger people, and, and this is probably, you know, the only way, hang on one second, this is probably the only way we're going to get these witless fucks out of power, and, you know, it's that you got to have faith in the young people, because if y'all drop the ball, we're fucked, because that's just, that's, I won't even go into that topic, but, um, so, um, so there are some you know, so people say, well, what's a, what's a way that a, a, a newbie could sort of start the ball rolling on a magical path? And, or how would a hardened skeptic try to check this kind of stuff out? And one thing that you could do would, to start that ball rolling would be an act of sex magic. And I, th- I know Grant's going to talk more about this, so I don't want to step on what he's going to say. But if you would hold a thought in your head, right, um, a visualization of something that you would like to see happen or something symbolic that you know, like, an uh, uh, example that Crowley would always use would be, like, picturing gold falling on his head <laughs> at the, the point of orgasm. You know, and that's a pretty stripped-down idea of what it is, but it, you get the idea. It's, 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 it's in a sense, it's, it's, is it wishcraft? You know, that famous New Age book. Is it wish? Uh, yeah, that's what it is. You can call it anything you want to call it. It's not, there's no real set rules on how to do this. But... Um, and in, as funny as Grant says in his, his uh, essay in uh, Pot Magic in the Book of Lies, that if you you know you, you have to work your magic in the real world, so buy a lottery ticket for God's sake if you're gonna if you're gonna do this kind of stuff and you know sigilize to win a lottery. So also there's a way that you maybe amplify this signal electronically. And I've done things like put sigils online with the idea that if somebody clicked on this link and they were confused by it, that their confusion I would siphon off a penny. Like that, you know, like a bank, like that the banker does, you know, siphon off a penny of that energy to work my thing, so no one's harmed, you know, and that you know, it's like a micropayment, right? And so, my spell casting benefits from that. You see what I'm saying? It's it's maybe it doesn't work, but maybe I just get jazzed up about it. You see what I'm saying? Maybe you, it's it's all part of it. It's, it's, it's all part of training yourself. So it's like if you can work yourself up, that's that's a big that's a big part of this. Getting jazzed, and when you know when they, when you do these uh, exercises that in many ways, you know, kind of nonsensical, but like when, you know, they read Latin and try to invoke, you know, invoke the demon and or, or, or the god or, you know, whatever you want to do. To, you, okay, simply put, they're getting jazzed. That's what they're doing. And that's, you know, and that's, and that's why a lot of these magical books from the past are, are, are nonsensical and not really of that much relevance to modern people because we don't... 
Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it used to be. I mean, I, it's, 5-MeO-DMT used to be something you could buy on the Internet. You could buy it from the back of high times. You can? It hasn't been scheduled yet? Oh, is that right? Well, okay, you guys would know. I guess. <laughs> so uh, you can get it, okay. Well, I, okay, so I haven't tried to get it. Yet. But anyways, I mean, the difference is like, you know, I mean, Terrence McKenna would say it was the difference between watching black and white TV and color TV. So one of these places is a populated space where it's like, whoa, and it's really weird. And the other one is like, you know, great visual light show at a laserium. It's probably the difference, the best way to describe it for people. I mean, you want to get the 4-MeO DMT when you're going to do it. It's scary, by the way. DMT is, I mean, it's every, everything you ever read about it, like, you know, like, old, like doing a bun, you know, jumping out of an airplane, or it's kind of, it is exactly like that. I see you're shaking your head. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it, it's frightening to do it. It's, it's worth it. You're going to love it. But, I mean, you might look at a loaded pipe for about two hours before you decide to huff that because it's fucking frightening. And then, you know, and even if you know you're going to be fine, it's still frightening the next time. You know what I mean? It's, it's a traumatic experience. It's great. <laughs> Should all do it. You know. But, uh, yeah. Anybody else? Great. So let's take a break, and then we're going to turn this podium over to Doug Rushkoff. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.